Welcome back to day five of rebuilding my playing. It was super fascinating to edit and obviously watch and listen to my video yesterday. Really, this is such an awesome affirmation that consistent daily fastidious work pays huge dividends um, if you are trying to rebuild your playing after a break or injury. I also ended up cutting out a ton of kind of monologuing that I was doing while I was practicing. And I talked about actually some things that are probably really important to talk about. So I do wanna say a little bit more about injury because really for me, this is about injury. Um, as you saw, if you have been watching and following along, which there's apparently a few number of people who are actually watching these on a uh, daily basis. Um, you saw me get up and stretch. I wanna talk, just kind of share, disclose kind of all the injuries. I've, I've been talking about my pacemaker implant, but I also need to share that I have many injuries that I've kind of had to battle against over the years. I've had four back surgeries, I have a few spine, I've had a dislocated shoulder, um, lots of strange things like that. So at this point in my life, I basically, my spine is basically mush. And so everything relating to my spine, neck, shoulders, all of these things, um, they're very interrelated for me. And they definitely cause a lot of problem. And definitely in the, in the last few years, just as I am heading into midlife, um, I kind of feel this pain all the time. And it's definitely uh, one of my biggest barriers probably to uh, performance and practicing is just getting into rehearsals and dealing with a lot of pain, especially on the right side. So it's something, I, I work with a massage therapist every two weeks and a chiropractor. And I guess I'm high maintenance at this point, except that I think all of us kind of run this risk. And I know uh, a lot of instrumentalists as they kind of head into their, their middle age, uh, if they're not really making a point of caring for their body, then they're all managing injuries to some extent. So I wanna reiterate what I said yesterday. Young people, if you're in relatively good shape, stay on it. If you are not maybe in the best shape, maybe start to make some changes because it really will, it really will impact your career. Maybe not in the sense that it'll prevent you from having the career that you desire, but I just don't, I think there's nothing worse than um, feeling pain when you're trying to do something that you really love and really do, really want and have great passion for. So it, it's just kind of a shame to have to deal with pain um, while trying to just kind of do this already complicated thing. So other things I thought about as I watched and edited that video, I've been watching carefully. I do this thing over here on the left side of my neck sometimes when I play and it kind of like tenses up. And I've seen this and conquered this before. And of course it's come back again. I noticed it, especially in the first three days. Yesterday I was much more aware of it. I didn't, I don't think I actually did it yesterday, but it's something I'm, I'm watching for. And if you have watched earlier videos, you may have noticed it. It's, it's, I don't really know it. You can kind of see it like tense up. I kind of like, I don't know. I, I really can't do it unless I'm playing. So I'm being really careful about that. Um, I'm also noticing as I play, I kind of end up leaning forward and my shoulders round, and this is really what gets me into trouble too, and I noticed it yesterday, especially right before I took my stretching break. So I'm gonna be really conscious today about keeping my shoulders back and down away from my ears. The other thing I noticed too, uh, right before I finished up with those thirds, I saw my embouchure change, where in general, I play with kind of a, you know, a down embouchure, a frown embouchure. But there's this fine line between like kind of a natural relaxed frowny embouchure and then you'll see like tired frown embouchure where it gets really tight here and the frown becomes more pronounced. And I saw that happen as I was working through um, the last set of thirds and it was such a clear indication that my, my embouchure was really exhausted. So certainly part of this process too is rebuilding my endurance in my embouchure. The last thing I want to address before I get into today's practice session is just to say a few words about working in higher education. So my career has basically been in performance until I won my job here at Brigham Young University in Idaho, which was a really huge paradigm shift for my career. I always wanted to be a performer and I always was a performer. And then this really unique opportunity opened up here and, and I, that's a whole other story. Uh, but something I've learned in higher education uh, is that while you are hired often to be the bassoon professor, um, the demands on your time in other areas, whether it's committee work and or academic classes, really does eat away at your 
performance time. And, and of course, I can have as many recitals as I want. That's not the issue. The issue is that daily practice, like having the time to really sit down every day uh, and do fantastic, highly focused practice. Oftentimes, and I've, I've chatted with colleagues uh, around the country, and if we're all totally vulnerable and honest, a lot of times our practice really is just what we do with our students in a lesson, which is great impetus for us to play with our students for many reasons, but sometimes it's also just because I think, oh my gosh, if I'm gonna play any scales and thirds today, it's gonna have to be in this lesson with this student. So that is something to kind of be aware of. If you're thinking about what your career goals are, um, higher education is obviously a wonderful career. It, it definitely, though, is many things that isn't that aren't just playing your bassoon, and it's something to be aware of. Um, ask a lot of questions of your teacher, like really say, like how you know how is your time divided, and also keep in mind that depending on where you're in school. Um, what a bassoon professor does in a day might look really different depending on the institution. But it's worth asking a lot of people about their experience in higher ed and then also knowing how important to, to you is high levels of performance or not. Uh, there are just all these positions are similar in some ways and also very, very, very different. So I just want to kind of throw that out there for those who are watching. I imagine a lot of people who will find this of interest are students. And so as you think about your career, whether you want to go into education or you want to go into performance, or of course many other careers related to music. But if, it, if it's bassoon centric, those are your you know, two big options there. Let's start practicing, shall we? <laughs> Time for long tones. I have my timer on. I'm just going to do 10 minutes of long tones. And because uh, yesterday for the second day in a row, I was really noticing my high A and high B were not, I was not hearing them correctly. I'm actually going to stop, start way up there before I drop down. <laughs> I'm hearing it's pretty easy in my opinion to um, do a 16 note 16 beat long tone come in very soft crescendo all that on, on your top octave what is revealed however is any inconsistencies of lip pressure and so that's what I'm hearing and that's definitely a ha hallmark of an embouchure that's out of shape or maybe not even warmed up for the day I'm hearing all the, the slight little quivers and changes in pressure in my lips and the best way to counteract that, in, in my experience, is really making sure that your air is very directed, extremely directed. Again, it's not very hard to articulate these softly, but it is hard to keep a pure, perfect tone um, up in this top octave. So I'm gonna really make sure that I'm spinning my air a lot and just like very focused, you know, a narrow stream uh, through the reed and just like totally continuous air. So. It, it, it's a different column of air. When, when we're playing down low, it's kind of this wide column. That's how I envision what I feel. And then when I'm up in my top octave, it's, it's much more narrow and much uh, faster and more directed. better definitely it's easier on the crescendo side to keep to get rid of that quiver because you can really push into that crescendo and then the challenge is definitely on the diminuendo side where as you're getting softer um, you're making these micro alterations to your embouchure and you can hear those in the tone
There is a wonderful section of um, Arthur Weisberg's book, The Art of Wind Playing, where he talks about the relationship or the ratio of lip pressure to volume. Highly recommend it. I don't have the book with me or else I'd give you the page number, but check out that book. He does the best job, I think, of all of the wind resources talking about um, air pressure and, well, air and, and lip pressure and then volume. And this is, this is a great example of that. reminder to me to not spend all of my time down the bottom octave which is definitely my default mode on long tones is just to spend all of my time or definitely most of my time down my bottom octave but hearing how much quiver uh, and unsteadiness is in my tone in this top octave definitely proves the value of making sure I'm splitting my time 50 50 between my top octave and my bottom octave and not probably in between as well uh, I am gonna pop down to my lower octave though now Okay, so those 10 minutes go really, really fast. I got not nearly enough accomplished. Um, I'm gonna spend five more minutes with this. But it is interesting, this is a good example of maybe adjusting your practicing for the hierarchy of success. So today, the attacks are a nightmare. But also, because I'm dealing with a, a, a cardiorespiratory recovery, I really, 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 as a greater priority, want to work on my um, lung capacity. So I really think for these next five minutes, I just need to let these attacks go again because I think right now for me, it is much more important to be building my lung strength and capacity than it is for me to be worrying about attacks. I will get to attacks, but I just think I can't focus on the attacks and also work on my cardiorespiratory endurance. It, it, they're just... I have to limit something. So I'm going to spend five more minutes and let go of the attacks for now and just work on my breathing, taking in enough air and then pushing out enough air. It really is a cardio uh, exercise at this point. <laughs> some of the issue is um, one of the the problems with with my recovery from my pacemaker is that I ended up having three ribs um, kicked out of place what's the word for that dislocated <laughs> I don't know why I said kicked out of place no one kicked me so I, I had three ribs that were that were out of place um, and so I ended up having for weeks maybe a few months extraordinary cramps that wrapped all the way around my torso which is really really challenging when you're a wind player obviously uh, so those ribs are now back in place but now I still feel um, as I expand my my abdomen and my chest to fill 
there is uh, like a weakness like I can't fill as much as I once used to and so that's definitely part of the cardiorespiratory aspect that I'm recovering from and so I need to I need to just spend a lot more time breathing in and just focusing on that and so I might even worry less about how my entrance is on these so I can just focus on pushing safely through and kind of building those muscles without causing pain yeah again injury you know this actually this is maybe a better exercise for me is to see how many beats I can sustain a crescendo rather than worrying about coming back down on the diminuendo side it's just um, pushing through a crescendo so alteration as needed. That was better. That was almost nine whole beats. Okay. So, you know, adjusting to actually fix the, the things that need to be fixed. And obviously I am struggling to do all the things at once to do attacks and then just a sustained tone. But I, I do think, as of tonight, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking I really do need to spend um, a lot of effort on just working on expansion of my lungs and filling and then expelling consistently. I'm going to start at 1.30 today. New note. I hear that last note, it goes, but I eat, but I eat, but I eat, but I eat, right? It, the last note goes sharp because I'm using too much embouchure. So I need to keep the pitch down all the way through. fiasco let's see I've been doing scales at 60 and I think I want to go a little bit faster so I'm just gonna bump it up to 65 again I'm in no rush to go fast because I'm building fundamentals rebuilding fundamentals so there's no need to go fast the need is to just be really clean at this point and you can really work more on cleanliness at slower speeds where you can see where the um, where coordination issues are occurring 
yesterday the connection from the B to the C sharp down to the A I fixed it I'm gonna do it again though make sure I have it right how about three times my tone was through the um, the second octave which was I think the best so far in the last you know since I started so I stuck with it because I wanted to kind of capture there and keep that tone uh, I'm gonna do it again though and attempt to do both a lovely tone and good connections in the bottom octave <laughs> I'm 
actually, my technique is weird because I'm thinking about the fourths and playing thirds and I keep jumping ahead. <laughs> ah, but I'm super happy with my tone. Uh, the read is working for me, but yeah, it just feels good. It feels full. Okay, so immediately. Okay, so what I thought to fix that was fast. Not fast tempo, fast fingers, fast fast coordinated transitions, and that was immediately better. Obviously, breaks are really important. So what to do during your break? Well, stretch your body. Even if you just lay down on the floor, stretch your body. Go get a drink. Don't break your focus, though, right? Your focus is, I am practicing. And if we get too distracted, if we get into social media, you know, I want you to I think it's going to just keep thinking. So if you stand up and you go get a drink of water and you stretch, I want you to be thinking about like, what did I do and what went well and what's happening next? Like don't totally break your focus on the task at hand. I think sometimes students feel like, Oh, I need a mental break. And then they go into these, these rabbit holes on their phones. And then a 10, 15 minute break turns into a 30 minute whatever. And then, and then they have to somehow get their mind back into their practice. And so then I think the rest of their practice is greatly um, compromised. So yes, you need to take a break and a rest and a stretch and let your mind rest, but also stay within the practice mode. It, it's, it's, it's not a, let me go crazy for 10 minutes and then try and refocus. Like let things rest that need to rest, but stay, stay your mind in the practice of practice. All right, I'm finally to fourths, my friends. Here we go. These are gonna be nightmarishly awful. So I'm probably gonna edit out a ton of this, <laughs> unless I have some really great realizations worth sharing. you know, uh, basically a whole step um, really changes your technique. I mean, you just hear me. It's just not clean going into that fourth each time and down, well down to the third. because I feel like it's been a task to get to this point in the last five days. So, yay. Okay, well, I did it. Uh, it's obvious where I need to spend time. But I'm actually um, very pleased with how well I did focus until I just got to the very end there, and then I cl clearly lost focus. Yeah. I'm going to leave that, and I'm going to add in another component. My broken arpeggios. I haven't touched those at all. Yeah, broken arpeggios. Okay. Those are fun. I'm gonna do those without a metronome, and I really like to focus just on pitch and flexibility of read when I do broken arpeggios. Um, Lori Wyke always had me do these at a, at a softer dynamic level and as a really excellent test for reads. So um, I don't know if I'm gonna do too soft with these just because again, I'm in a hierarchy of recovery and and rebuilding and so I do want to focus on pitch though and just general concepts of flexibility especially with the down slurs but I think I'll just play like a nice mezzo forte so I don't overwhelm myself and feel defeated. <laughs>
hierarchy of recovery. I'm just going to kind of plow through these and see how bad it all is. <laughs> to a high F without playing, I don't know, three, three notes in between. You just let me know how that's done. That felt really nice on my armature. So yeah, that's a... Uh, it's a new element. It's gonna take a lot of work. I'm gonna go ahead and do minors. an hour and 30 minutes so this is my longest practice session to date again incredible how quickly things really are improving as I just put into work each night it's really really great lots of work to do I mean there's always lots of work to do even if I was at the tip top of my playing there would be lots of work to do but let's assess so um I want to make sure I'm doing my long tones in my top octave tomorrow Mm, I want to make sure I spend some good time on um, the back end of my thirds. So I'm going to, I think I'll, I have a really bad habit of always starting on B flat and then working up chromatically. So I think tomorrow I'll start my thirds on A and descend down chromatically through the scale so that I have energy up front to work on those later keys, which were much, me a lot messier. Super excited. I made it through fourths. I have a lot of work with finger coordination and thinking fast transitions. And then I definitely, I might actually work those broken arpeggios uh, earlier into my practice session because gosh, that is such a great exercise for flexibility and just making sure that I'm keeping my embouchure nice and loose. All those lovely down slurs are so helpful. But yeah, again, just a, a great practice session that leaves me feeling motivated and excited to just play and improve and to think critically about um, the process of being a great instrumentalist. So thanks for watching for those who have endured all the way through this. I hope it's helpful to you and definitely leave any comments if you have questions uh, or thoughts on things you'd love to see me cover. I will say I have by no means exhausted the elements of a typical practice session. There's still so much more to get in. And I haven't even touched an etude book. So that's exciting. See you tomorrow, friends.